Words at War. I will tell you my story. The story of a lady who died. Hey, listen to the old lady, fellas. Some gag, huh? <laughs> I am the submarine tender USS Canopus, known to my men as the old lady. Or rather, I was the USS Canopus. For now I'm dead. On the day that Batan fell, on April 9th, 1942, I was proudly sent to the bottom by my own men. Sent to my death. Forever. Listen, old lady. Don't make us laugh. I'm one of your boys. One of the guys who helped send you to the bottom that day off Batan. I died in a Jap prison camp. When a man dies, nobody can bring him back. But if you think the United States Navy has let you die... Listen, old lady. Don't make me laugh. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, presents another in the distinguished series, Words at War dramatizing the most important books to come out of the present great world conflict. Tonight we bring to life an excerpt from an outstanding new book wrote, written from official sources by two officers of the United States Naval Reserve. The book is Battle Report, Pearl Harbor to Coral Sea by Commander Walter Kerrig and Lieutenant Welburn Kelly. Our dramatization tonight concerns a little-known story of the Navy's part in the heroic but ill-fated battle to defend Bataan and Corregidor. It centers around the gallant submarine tender USS Canopus, the old lady to her men, and that weird but wonderful collection of seagoing land fighters who have now entered our nation's history and legend as the foot sailors of Bataan. I am the USS Canopus, the old lady to my men, wherever they may be. I lie here now underneath the waters between Maravelas and Corregidor, near the outer entrance to Manila Bay. But even in death, I'm happy. But listen, that's the Navy shelling the Japanese on the coast of Luzon. And listen, that's General MacArthur and his men. They've all come back to the Philippines. They have returned. But I can remember back to the time when the only guns fired in the Philippines were aimed at us, not fired by us. I can remember back to the time when we, my men and I, heard a message broadcast on the day that will live in infamy. And I can remember, in the days that immediately followed, how the tension mounted among my officers and men. For they soon knew, all of them, that we had been picked out for something special. Nobody would admit it at first, as we watched all the other ships of the Asiatic fleet put out to sea, leaving us behind. But we knew. We knew we had to stay and tend our submarines until the Japs made it too hot for the subs to stay in the Manila area. But the word was passed that we would have to stay and take it, even after our subs were gone. Nobody wanted to believe it. No. No, they couldn't do that to us. They couldn't. All right, men. All right, come on. Sweep them down. And bear a hand about it. We may be tied up here in the middle of a wall like a sitting duck. But if we get knocked off, the old lady's going down with our decks clean, see? Oh, uh, good morning, Mr. Goodall. Good morning, Chief. Nice weather we're having for just a week before Christmas. Yes, sir, it is. Hot as a fox, though. Not like a week before Christmas back stateside. Oh, uh, Mr. Goodall. Yes, Chief? Uh, well, sir, uh, you know I've been on this tub for a long time. Off and on ever since the Navy took her over from the Grace Line back in 21. <laughs> yes, I know. You're practically a plank owner. Yes, sir. And I'm pretty proud of the old lady. I know that, too. She's a happy ship, Chief. Yes, sir, and always was. Why, I remember when she first joined the fleet. 
Guys used to try to kid me about a name. They'd say, hey, sailor, what ship you off? Are you on that USS can opener? <laughs> I know. I guess we've all been kidded about it. And I seem to remember that you've had some arguments about the old lady, Chief. Well. Let's see. It seems I heard about one down in Guantanamo. Well, sir, he spoke with disrespect about the old lady, didn't he, sir? Called her the can opener now, didn't he? I never did hear any details, Chief. As I got it, officially speaking, that is, it was just a friendly discussion between friends. And after the discussion, you volunteered to buy your friend a set of false teeth. Seems he ran into a door or something. <laughs> I'm proud of the old lady, sir. That's that's what I want to talk to you about. I know, Chief. I'm the executive officer, and everybody thinks I know all the answers. Go ahead. Oh, well, sir, Mr. Goodall, the war's been going on for ten days now. Here we are, still tied up in Manila. The old lady's a fighting ship, sir. Her place is at sea, not at a dock in Manila. She should be... I out. know, Chief, and I feel the same way. But the skipper's running this ship, Chief. And on the old lady... Everybody carries out orders. Understand? Aye, aye, sir. With your permission, sir, nobody's questioning the old man's orders. We'll all follow him, even if he's headed straight for the bottom of Manila Bay. Yes, I was the ship, and they were the men. And together we were one. As the days passed, Japan's aviators made it plainer and plainer that Manila... And Manila Bay could not be held with the American forces present. The submarines attached to me had to submerge in the bay during daylight hours, coming up only at night. But this couldn't last. We were tied up next to submarine headquarters, and on Christmas Eve, the Japs came over and gave us their full attention. Japs hit sub-headquarters, next to where we were tied up. My decks and side plates were spattered with shrapnel. After it was all over, Commander Sackett, my skipper, sent for Lieutenant Commander Goodall. Sent for me, Captain? Yes, Hap, uh... Sit down. Not a very pleasant Christmas Eve, sir. I'm afraid Hap December 24th, 1941 will never linger in my memory as Christmas Eve. I'm glad to see, though, the crew seems to be celebrating. Yes. I feel I should tell you, sir, that they're... Well, they're all restless about our situation. They... Mm-hmm. Damage reports show the ship didn't get hurt too badly today. A few shrapnel holes here and there. No serious casualties, thank God. I called you in, half to tell you to make the ship ready to get on the way. Get on a... Captain, that's... Why, sir, that's the best Christmas present the crew could get. They don't mind the Japs, but they want to be out where they can fight back. But, well, wait, half wait. I, I know how the men felt, how you felt. With the war going on, they hated to be tied up doing no fighting on their own. Not only that, sir, they've seen all the other ships go out. The Houston, the Langley, the Trinity, the Holland, all the destroyers. Why, so we're the only ship of any size left in the Manila area. I know, Hap, and we've got to stay here. But, sir, our submarines... They're leaving us today. After the bombing, they can't stay in Manila. Naturally, sir, but they'll need a tender to take care of them. They'll be taken care of by another subtender. We stayed here and cared for them as long as we could. Now it's too late for us to get out. We could try, sir. The men are all for it. I know they'd like to make a running fight to get out. No ship's ever had a better crew. But the Japs are in too much force to the south. Besides, we've got another job to do here in the Manila area. Aye, aye, sir. I'll give the order to prepare the ship for getting underway. Uh, before you go, Hap, uh, come over here and take a look out this port. Huh? Over toward Manila. Rather a fireworks display, isn't it? Uh, not a pleasant one, sir. That means Manila is now an open city. Right. The army is burning all the supplies. It couldn't get out. But, sir, the troops on the ten. In a bad way. Not cut off yet, but they'll need all the help they can get. Well, we've still got the Canopus, and I think the old lady might be able to lend a hand. Now we'll find a spot over the tip of a tan. Maravelli's would be a good place, I should say. We'll hide the ship as best we can. When we up anchor, sir, the crew will think we're headed out to sea. Shall I tell them? I think you know how I feel about that, Hap. We're both sailors. 
We'd rather be out taking our chances with the fleet. Tell the men that if we're ever so ordered, we'll all go out of here together. We'll take the old lady out, and we'll take her out fighting. My men were happy when they got the word that sometime, maybe sometime, they'd had the chance to take me out to sea where we felt we all belonged. Meanwhile, we had a job to do, backing up the boys on Batan. But I think the men knew that they didn't have much of a chance. And I knew. For ships have a feeling about these things, too. We knew all the time, even when we eagerly tuned in for those rosy and optimistic broadcasts that came back from the States telling us how splendidly we were doing in the Philippines. We all knew, I think, even as my men walked me close to shore near Maravelas Harbor, between Corregidor and the tip of Batan, and set to work at camouflage to hide me from prying Japanese eyes. Hey, the wall there! Hey, Chief! Yes, I hear you. What is it? Up here on the bridge, Chief! You see how I've got this green netting strung from the bridge to the smoke pipe? Yes, I see it. Now string some from the bow down to the bridge and make it artistic-like. Listen, Chief, the way I'm dressing the old lady up way, Hattie Carnegie herself couldn't do a better job. Yeah, you said it, son. Us, a bunch of fighting seamen, and the old lady a fighting ship, and us dressing her up like she was headed for a cheap Saturday night dance. <laughs> some war. Hello, Chief. How's it going? Well, we're doing the best we can, Captain. Mr. Goodall tells me you're not happy about it. You think the Japs will spot us, huh? If they don't, Captain, they're blinder than some folks used to think they were before Pearl Harbor. Any suggestions? No, well, we've done everything we can to hide the old lady, Captain. We used all the netting and green paint we could lay in hands on, but... Captain, you, you see this high cliff right back of us? Yes, there's nothing we can do about that. No, sir, there isn't. But you see, if Jap planes fly over Corregidor and then head this way, why, well, they're bound to see us outlined against the cliff. And that's with camouflage or no camouflage. Yes, I know. They bombed us a week ago. Yeah, this time, Captain, I hope we've done a better camouflage job. You don't sound too optimistic, but I think we'll soon find out, Chief. Mr. Goodall, sound General Quarters. General Quarters! Hey, hey, hey. Here he comes! Watch out! Watch! All the wounded have been taken to dressing station set up for sure, sir. Thank you, doctor. See that they get every care you can give them. Now, as to the ship. The hole's all along the side, sir. There's one big hole through the main deck, sir. One bomb struck the top of the smoke pipe and exploded. All exposed areas were damaged by shrapnel. The bow is dished in forward, sir, and there are several holes below the waterline. The ship has taken water. It's already a sharp list. She's heeling over on her side. I've started the pumps and repair parties. Tell the repair parties to seal up every hole that's taking water, Hap. Stop the pumps. But, sir, the list. We can't take the list off the ship until we pump her out. I know, I know. Chief, how much work's the Army sending us? About all we can handle, Captain. Looks like everything they bust up on Batan, they send it in to us. Gun mechanisms, engines, tank fittings, airplane propellers. Why, yesterday an army dentist asked us to build some fancy mouth bridge work. And? <laughs> Why, Captain, we built it for him, naturally. A man can't fight unless he can eat. And a man can't eat unless he's got a good set of crockery. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, gentlemen, it's obvious we can't hide the Canopus from the Japs. We tried that and failed. If the Japs bomb us again, our machine shops may be wrecked. And the boys on Batan need the stuff our shops turn out. Now I have a plan. If it works... The Japs won't bother us again. Well, what is it, Captain? What are you going to do, sir? The Japs may do things that seem strange to us, gentlemen. But even the Japs are not silly enough to drop bombs on a ship that's already been bombed and sunk. Bombed and sunk? But, Captain, you don't mean... No, sir. Hap. I don't intend to scuttle the old lady. Of course, my plan may not work, but we've got to try it. Now, let's see. When is the Jap photo reconnaissance plane due over on his regular flight? Photo Joe from Tokyo? Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, I'll make it uh, just two hours, sir. And he's never more than five minutes off. Two hours. Then we've got to get busy. 
When Photo Joe comes over again, the old lady's going to look the very way she's probably already been described in Japanese propaganda. According to Japanese Imperial Flight Headquarters, Formosa, acknowledge. Japanese Imperial Flight Headquarters, Formosa, you may report, please. Now flying over U.S. Navy submarine tender Canopus between uh, Corregidor and Maravillas, Manila Bay. Ship is uh, listed over on side. Bad list. Deck is a shambles of wreckage. All uh, topside wrecked. Large holes in deck. Smoke pouring from holes. Uh, she is no more. U.S. Navy submarine tender Canopus is uh, uh, destroyed to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Destroyed to pieces. <laughs> ah, the Japs love that expression. And how many times they've used it to tell their people that our fleet was no more. <laughs> but I was not destroyed to pieces. I, the USS Canopus, was very much alive. <laughs> Man, it works. Uh, it works. How about up there, Chief? Has Photo Joe gone? Uh, headed straight for Tokyo, Captain. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and lying and bragging all the way. <laughs> all right, man. You can put those smudge, uh, put those smudge pots out. Yes, sir. I'll leave all the wreckage top, uh, topside just as it is and don't do anything to take the list off the ship. If the Japs think we're finished, all the better for us. Maybe we can catch up with our work for the men on Bataan. Bridget would like to see you, sir. Bridget? Frank Bridget of Pat Wing 10? Yes, sir. But all the Pat Wing 10 planes have gone south with the Navy ships. Commander Bridget stayed behind, sir, like the Canopus. Well, show him in. Yes, sir. Come right in, sir. Hello, Frank. Good to see you, Sackett. Good to see you. Well, what goes, Frank? Have the Japs broken our lines on Batan? Oh, no, nothing that serious. Yet. Our lines are holding, but that's just about all. They're getting weaker every day. I'm worried about what might happen behind our lines. What do you mean? Well, as you know, the Army has stabilized the front on Bataan, about 20 miles north of there. Yes, I, I do. The machine shops of the Canopus, well, they're humming night and day, forging arms and repairing equipment. Right. But between here and the Army's lines, well, there's very little to prevent the Japs from landing. And if they do, why, they'll cut off the men on Bataan. Yes, yes, I see what you mean. Well, Frank, what can be done about it? What can the Canopus do? You've only let us know. I knew you'd feel that way about it. Well, Admiral Rockwell and General Wainwright have ordered me to form a defense battalion. A sort of, uh, well, a naval defense battalion. Sort of seagoing land fighters. But, Frank, uh, where do you get the men? They just don't exist. Every man the Army's got is desperately needed on Corregidor or Batan. Well, I've got about 150 sailors, ground crewmen that were left behind when the planes of Pat Wing 10 fought their way south. Yes, but only 150 men. Yes, that's only a few, I know. But I've got another 100 sailors that were left with nothing to do when the ammo dump at Cavite was blasted off the map. And, uh, well, I was hoping for a hundred or two from the Canopus. A hundred or two? But, Frank, these men are sailors. They've had no training in land tactics. Ah, but I've thought of that, too. You see, uh, I've got about a hundred unassigned Marines. So we'll train our sailors as land fighters. That is, if the Japs will just give us time. Well, how many men do I get from the Canopus? Hmm. Leave me shorthanded. Well... I'll let you have 130. Good. And, uh, Frank, you might pass the word that old Lady Canopus has never yet turned down a call for help. And never will. That was what all of my men thought of me and felt about me. From the skipper on down. A ship is sensitive about such things. And a ship is a proud ship. Only when she and her men are one. <laughs> oh, but it was amusing to watch my men in training on the drill field they set up ashore. My executive officer, Goodall, was second in command to Commander Bridget. And the chief, <laughs> well, he finally broke down and confessed, somewhat ashamed, that he'd once done a hitch in the army. <laughs> so they made him a drill master. The sailors only had white uniforms, so they dyed them in coffee grounds. The uniforms came out a bright yellow. But finally, 
the chief got the sailors whipped into some kind of shape with, with the help of the marines. And they set off on their first defensive maneuvers. Get in there, step you swap jockeys. What's the gyries do as they do? They're not doing too badly, Chief. Oh, I want them to look smart, Mr. Goodall. Of course, they haven't had much training, but what if the Army was to see them in them yellow uniforms? Everyone with a different kind of gun. Well, the Army had never stop laughing. Look at them yellow uniforms. A bunch of yellow perils. Well, the army on Bataan hasn't got much to laugh about, Chief. Things are looking very grim. Yeah, I know, Mr. Goodall. Company, halt! At ease. Yeah, but things would be a lot worse for them if the Japs were to decide to land along in here somewhere and cut them off on Bataan from the rear. Well, let's hope that doesn't happen, at least until this outfit learns a little more about land war. Hey, what? Chief! Chief! That's like caliber Japanese stuff. Yeah, we'll soon find out, Mr. Goodall, because here comes an army coastal lookout, and he's losing no time. Hey, Joe! Stop up a bit, bud. What's that racket up ahead? The Nips. They've landed. I've got to get the word to the Army GHQ. Yeah, sure, sure. You, you pass the word along, pal. All right, you swab jockeys and gyrenes. This is what we didn't get a chance to train for. Let's go get them! <laughs> Sailors of the tan. Someday their full story will be told. A story of five days of the weirdest and most unorthodox fighting on record. The Japanese were picked men, well trained in land warfare. They knew that in breaking through the enemy's lines, you first located the position of the enemy's reserves. Then you attacked where the reserves weren't. But of course, that was the joke. The men who had trod my deck, the men from the Canopus, and the other sailors and marines, they didn't have any reserves. And there were a lot of orthodox rules of land warfare, which they didn't know anything about, had never heard. They only knew that their naval textbook said, attack and destroy. On the third day, Mr. Goodall, Mr. Goodall. Yes, Chief. The Japs have infiltrated us. They've sneaked men between our lines. They're behind us. Why you get so excited about it? Do something about it. Do, do something. Look, Mr. Goodall, I'm not trying to tell you how to run this war, but I've had some experience in land maneuvers. If the enemy outflanks you or gets behind your lines, you're supposed to retreat. That's one of the rules. I read it in the book. Never mind the book. Send some men back there and clean out those Japs. This was strange warfare, and the Japs didn't understand it. This kind of warfare worried the Japs. In fact, one Nipponese officer sat down and wrote of his complete bewilderment. The Americans are using a new type of suicide squad. They wear bright yellow uniforms. They thrash about and make a plenty of noise. When they reach open space, they sit down on a stump and light a cigarette, to talking to each other in loud voices. Then, when we move, they shoot. It is very difficult, most difficult, to combat these methods. And such tactics are little short of insane. The foot sailors not only held the Japs, they began to push them back, never allowing the enemy to do the damage for which he'd been put ashore. At the end of five days, the foot sailors, fewer in number, all tired and many wounded, were relieved by the gallant Filipino scouts. The Japs were pushed back into the sea. Perhaps it is yet too early to pass a judgment, but there's a chance. A very good chance, mind you, that the foot sailors and marines kept Bataan from falling by days and even weeks. But of course, the end was only postponed. We all had known it for some time. And on April 9th, 1942, Commander Sackett called all the officers and men together on my decks. The retreating army was destroying its supplies in Bataan, and the Japs were advancing, ever victorious. 
All right, men. This is the end for us and the old lady. We're finished here. I told you earlier today we would be on our own as soon as the army surrendered on Bataan. I told you that because we all know that Corregidor's overcrowded and already on short rations. However, I've just received later word from GHQ on Corregidor. They've decided to take just two units. One unit's an army outfit. The other is the naval forces at Maravelis. The officers and men of the USS Canopus. But the ship, sir, the old lady. Can we blow her up where she lies? We will not. The old lady's still got steam in the boilers. She's going out of here under her own power. We'll give her the decent burial she deserves. In deep water. All right, men. A song. A goodbye. For the old lady. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arms that find the restless way, who bid the mighty ocean deep in own appointed limits keep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee. For those in peril on the sea. Well, that's my story. At least, part of my story. I, the submarine tender USS Canopus, known to my men as the old lady, I'm dead. Buried beneath the waters between Corregidor and Batan. Listen, old lady, this is the chief. I'm dead, see? I died in the Jap prison camp down on Mindanao. But you dead? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Yes, chief. As I lie here underneath the waters of Manila Bay, I am dead. Dead and gone forever. Yeah? Well, listen to what it says here in this book. A book called Battle Report. I'll read it. But was this true? Was it true that there would never be another Canopus? Hell no, it was not true, said the Navy Department. Although perhaps not officially in these words. The old lady was too good a ship to die. There would be a new Canopus, bigger, faster, stronger. And the gods of the sea being kind, almost as stout-hearted and true as the old lady herself. That's what it says in the book. And I can tell you, old lady, a new Canopus is in the works. The Navy's promise is being kept. The name Canopus will live forever. Tonight on Words at War, we've brought you a dramatization of excerpts from the book entitled Battle Report by Commander Walter Kerrig and Lieutenant Welburn Kelly. The adaptation of his book was written by Lieutenant Kelly, and Miss Anne Seymour was the voice of the Canopus. The music was arranged and played by William Meter, and the production was under the direction of Anton M. Leiter. Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of Faith of Our Fighters by Captain Elwood C. Nance. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC Network. Jack Costello speaking. This is the National Broadcasting